Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this thematic day on Pencil Bank with folks on clean tech. Uh, I'm happy to uh, uh, announce the first presenter today, uh, Hexicon, a recently quoted company that is uh, developing offshore wind farms. Henrik, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Orian, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to start off this day and uh, come here for the first time as a quoted company. Uh, so thank you for having us. Uh, uh, I will talk about uh, joining the future, and that is really what uh, we have uh, set up and taken to the Stockholm Stock Exchange. It's uh, a capitalized hexagon uh, which will, uh, is developing floating wind farms in several jurisdictions, and I'll come back to that. So uh, a short introduction, we're quite unknown, I would guess, to most of the listeners today. Uh, uh, but um, we went public in uh, June of 21 on the uh, uh, first North Premier list in Stockholm. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the market developments, uh, update on our business, and uh, some uh, forward-looking uh, uh, statements. Uh, so in brief, Hexicon, we have our own patented technology that we have developed, which is a floater that carries two standard wind turbines. And it's turbine agnostic, meaning that size and manufacturer uh, will all be fitted on a, a design of our, uh, uh, from us. And the, and the protect the IP is all about having two turbines on one unit. So it's a, a steel triangle with two corners carrying one turbine each, and the front corner carries a single point mooring system that allows the whole structure to change direction with the wind. So the two turbines are always side by side in all wind directions. And I'll come back to the technology a little bit later. We have a, a partnership uh, model on how we develop. We don't do all the engineering and project development in-house. We use best-in-class engineering companies on a global basis. And we have, uh, this is a very capital intensive industry. Uh, utilities and uh, oil companies are dominant. And uh, we have carved out a business model which is asset light, all in relative terms. Uh, we have accumulated about 50 million uh, or, or 450 million Swedish crowns uh, in new capital over the last one and a half years. Uh, which is for Hexagon uh, a, a significant capitalization, but in the industry context, it's not the large amount. So we try to be very focused on our business model being asset light. And we have presence already in some of the key markets. So we stand on two legs, and we uh, say internally it's easier to walk if you have two legs to stand on in our business model. And we uh, walk fast because this industry is really catching on very quickly. Uh, for every year we have, over the last three years, we have started out in January saying that uh, we ended last year uh, with a lot of surprises over the, next, over the last 12 months. And the same this year, we don't recognize what the market looks like today. 12 months back, and the same now. We will don't know how the market would look in 12 months only because it's changing so rapidly. And I'll give some examples on that. So as a, as a project developer uh, on the green left side, we actually originate new markets. And why is that in demand? Well, uh, Onshore wind is already a mature industry in over 100 countries around the world. Offshore wind is over the last 20 years developed in five, six countries in the North Sea, led by England and, and Germany. Floating wind, and there's about 7,000 turbines operating in shallow water. Uh, 
Floating wind has been tested for 12 years and there's 18 turbines in operation today as we speak. So it's still a very novel industry, but it will be thousands of turbines over the next 10 years. And, and that is the commercialization of floating wind, which is the driving force for our growth going forward. And there are so many countries around the world that have deep water in their coastline that don't have any of these 7,000 turbines. And they all want to have not only onshore wind, but also offshore wind, and they have to go floating. So we originate new markets, and that is our early stage development skill set that we have developed. Uh, uh, we do that by, in each market, uh, we establish a partnership with a local partner, either a wind developer onshore that wants to go offshore, or a, a, a company from the value chain in that country. Because we combine the skill set of Hexagon, which is generic, with the local skill set that you need in each market. And we do that either in a joint venture or in a license agreement. And then uh, what we try to achieve is to develop an attractive water area for a floating wind farm of commercial size. And we then charge our clients with developing this site. And we try to achieve, which we have so far, to get equity options on those wind farms. So we try to build a, a business case that is compelling enough for clients to pay for it and also give us an equity kicker when the wind farm is developed. On the right side, we develop technology and that has really how the company got started. It was the vision of having a more efficient wind farm, having two turbines on each floater side by side. And the beauty with floating wind is that you're not dependent on water depth. Uh, each unit is the same on the same drawings, whether it's 100 meters deep or 500 meters deep. It's only the mooring system that changes. And that gives the uh, possibility of scaling and bringing the cost down with serial manufacturing. So why then do we have, what's the benefit of the Swedish design, the patented design from Hexicon? Well, what we think is the most uh, important trend over time is that as you would think that the ocean is abundant of space, but when you start putting uh, the layers of commercial shipping and fishing and military, you see that all water is not available. So you, you want to have, when you have, a, when you have defined a water space that is attractive, you want to have as much power capacity in that water space. And this is what we call power density. And, and uh, uh, that is achieved by having two turbines side by side on a hexagon floater. And that can give you up to 40% more power, more turbines in a given water area without having more turbulence or wake effect. And this is a very important uh, factor. Uh, of course, there are savings both in uh, capex and opex. You can imagine that when you go to uh, maintain the turbines, you make one crew shop to the unit and you maintain two turbines instead of one. You have half as many mooring systems to maintain. And installation cost, every time you install a unit, you do it for two turbines instead of one. So there are a two for one concept, which makes it also more cost efficient. And, and the, this layout is just to show you that the, the, we've done some uh, simulations on the North Sea weather systems and we have been able to uh, uh, simulate and see that in a given uh, sea area we could have 24 turbines with the same wake effect as with sing any single turbine technology, only 15 turbines. And of course that gives you the power density that I talk talked about on the previous slide. And this all equates to a low lower cost of energy. Um, our technology roadmap uh, is uh, uh, two projects that we are pursuing right now. 
Uh, one is with the uh, second-hand turbines, two Vestas 90, V90s, that we will start construction in the end of 2022 and will have in operation in the end of 23. Um, we have recently uh, contracted with the uh, international uh, contractor uh, Worley to construct and fabricate this unit. And um, uh, this will be the first full-scale demonstrator of the Hexicon technology. In step two, um, we actually, um, which is quite... Uh, 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 much to our business DNA is to be an early mover. We will participate in the first floating wind auction in the UK that is opening up in uh, March uh, with a water area we acquired last year. And that will be for up to 40 megawatts. If we are awarded this 15-year CFD award in the UK, we will have two turbines in operation by the end of 24, beginning of 25, in this water area. It's on the southwest coast of the UK. Um, then going to our project portfolio, um, this is where we probably have spent most of our energy over the last three, four years, is to, since the lead times are so long for development technology, and we want to become a profitable company as quickly as possible. We, had this, we set out uh, already four years ago to develop projects, commercial projects, where we can earn uh, uh, revenue and profit, uh, even uh, if the technology takes longer to develop. And we started out in Korea in uh, 2018, almost four years ago. Uh, a country which is one of the largest economies in the world, but a far away from Stockholm. And um, we were able to, uh, with our technology, uh, give a Korean company exclusive rights in, uh, in a license agreement into a joint venture called Cohen's Hexagon, where Hexagon uh, uh, it's, it's a true partnership uh, where they provide the local skill set for permitting and we provide the technology and the wind farm development skills. And that's pretty much was also the cornerstone for setting our business model. And in Korea, we were able to be shortlisted with some other companies in a, uh, in a province on the east coast, the city of Ulsan. And there we were... Uh, obtained uh, the rights for a water area large enough, 240 square kilometers, to attract uh, the really big companies to buy into it. And we were lucky enough to be, um, to be uh, uh, getting the attention of Shell Oil, the uh, uh, now UK-based oil company. And Shell uh, is the first of the oil majors who has decided to transition into cleaner energy. Uh, they set out their new strategy in 2016, and uh, uh, this is uh, by far their largest floating wind uh, farm development as of today, even four years later, uh, for deep water. Uh, and in Korea, as a spin-off of this, we have already since then been able to develop some uh, additional provinces. And as we announced only a few uh, weeks ago, we have now obtained in two additional provinces four new water areas, which we are right now uh, doing the feasibility studies on to see how we can farm out at a later stage. Uh, why do we do this? Well, this what we try to explain on this uh, slide is the value enhancement curve over time. And we tried to, you could really uh, categorize it in three separate uh, segments. It's an early stage development, mid stage development, and late stage development, which where you uh, investigate and prepare for construction to, and obtaining all the permits for producing electricity. And in large scale, these are very uh, interesting propositions. And we've put some numbers on what we have assessed from transactions in the industry all over the world, 
in what trading range are people conducting transactions. So as you can see from the early stage when you start with your first investment over the years until you have construction start, FID, it, it's, in, it's multiples of, 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 of value enhancement that you can achieve. So the highest risk, of course, is in the beginning, and that's where we are most active. And then these the projects are maturing over the three to five years to become a tradable asset. And uh, uh, as an example, uh, to give you sort of the motivation at Hexicon to have skin in this game, is that we saw just in the uh, fourth quarter of last year how... Uh, uh, a company, uh, a uh, Italian oil company, bought 10% of uh, Dogger Bank section, a size of 1,200 megawatt, and for 10% they paid 90 million dollars cash before spending money on constructing the wind farm. So these are very serious uh, money if you are successful over the development of these wind farms. It doesn't come easy, but it's worth to work, worth to work for. And uh, what we foresee at Hexagon is that we, over the next three to four years, will be a important part, or floating wind will be an important part of the um, portfolio of energy, not only in the South North Sea because of shallow water, but actually on a global basis. And, and Hexagon will be a significant player, one of the leading ac ac uh, players in this uh, floating wind market. And uh, uh, we are able to be that, as, and especially being an early mover, as we have our own technology. The technology in itself opens up a market. Countries, uh, all energy is politics, and that means you want to... Uh, engage the value chain in the local market. And by bringing the IP to a new country, they will embrace you and give you that water right. Uh, at least we are part of the, if we are at the right time in the market, we are invited, uh, not because we are a good developer, but because we have technology that is protected and brings value. Our goals for 2025 is that we will have ongoing revenue from projects in all three uh, marketplaces, Europe, USA and Asia, which we already have started in. Um, the technology will be verified and tested and proven by 2025. As I said in the technology roadmap, we will have uh, start operation in Norway in 23 and we will start operation in the UK in 25. Uh, the Norwegian one with the three megawatt turbines and larger new turbines in the UK project. And these two projects will have proven the benefits of the Hexagon patents. And on the financial side, we expect to be EBITDA prof positive by 2025 or earlier. And the main revenue drivers of the time from today to 2025 is project development, not technology licenses. From 2025 and onwards, when the technology is proven, we expect license revenue to pick up. But the majority of our earnings uh, last year, uh, which was quite much higher than the year before, but still is fairly nominal, but uh, we expect that to, to grow rapidly over the next three to five years as we are expanding our portfolio. And scaling the business model is what is needed to bring that into significant numbers. And the key building blocks for doing this is that we cannot do this alone. Not even uh, Swedish Vattenfall does wind farm development alone. Uh, we do this in partnerships and working with other companies has been part of our DNA as a startup, but now as a growth company, we try to refine our model for partnerships. We want to continue to optimize our technology and do that both with internal uh, resources, but also with, uh, with external partners. And we want to expand our organization to be covering several new markets. 
And I'd like to say that uh, one of the big findings of going public uh, in the middle of last year is that uh, as we are recruiting more skilled talent into the company, it actually has enhanced more well than we thought the attractiveness of Hexicon as an employer. It is easier for us now than it was a year ago to attract really uh, uh, experienced talent to come work for us. Uh, people actually are moving to Sweden to work for Hexicon. That was quite amazing when we saw that. So it's, it's quite uh, a thrill to work with this right now, actually. So uh, on market development, I think that one of the game changers of 2021 was COP26. And some people, in the, when you read m in media, you see that people are disappointed on the results and others are, are neutral about it. But I think it was quite uh, a milestone. And, and, the, key, and for, the reason for saying that is that uh, actually so many countries have signed off on reducing coal as the main driver for energy production. And that is the dirtiest fuel and is the dominant fuel for energy. And to reduce that, you have to go into offshore wind. There's no way of doing that without going on to offshore wind in large scale. And, and we have over the last year also seen that the US has geared up into floating wind. So both California and Oregon on the west coast of the US, they've had introduced legislation and bills to have floating wind in large scale within the next 10 years. And we will see additional states in the US coming uh, along on the same movement. Spain, where we have a presence since a few years, have announced targets of one to three gigawatt over the next 10 years. And we know that France will have its first auction in 2022. So in a few months time, it's only 250 megawatts, but still they are moving ahead. And we know that legislation is changing now in Italy, in, uh, in Greece and in, uh, in Ireland and even in Sweden, actually. Uh, we have new legislation on its way uh, that was uh, uh, passed by the government in the last few months. And uh, the Swedish uh, SVK, uh, the grid owner, has the assignment to come up with a offshore grid uh, investment by the summer, and that will dictate the terms for offshore wind in the Baltic Sea and on the West Coast. Uh, so what has happened since we went public? Well, uh, quite a few things. Our big project with Shell in uh, Korea, called Mumumbaram, re received its first uh, electricity license in the end of last year, and we expect two more to come within short. Uh, our um, uh, uh, demonstrator project in Norway got the DNV uh, feasibility certificate uh, end of last year, and we're now into the feed process with Worley, which is contracted, and we have secured turbines that will be dismantled in a onshore wind farm in the summer of 22. Uh, our patents are granted in Stockholm, that was already done uh, one and a half year ago, but EPO, which is the European Patent Office, they gave us notice of a grant. Uh, it's not the grant is not received yet, but the notice of a grant was received, and that covers 38 countries. So we have invested now in going global with registering our patents also for Asian countries and the US. Uh, also, uh, we see that the Swedish market will take off. Uh, we want to have a home market. So we have uh, invited uh, Norwegian Aker, uh, Aker Offshore Wind, to buy into our Swedish portfolio. And we are developing this as a joint venture by the name of Freya. And that uh, is a 50-50 setup. And uh, we are pursuing then uh, presently three projects, two in the Baltic Sea and one on the West Coast. Uh, they have already gone through consultation with the municipalities. Um, and as I said before, uh, our joint venture in Korea has already obtained new water areas for over one and a half gigawatts. So, um, the uh, Norwegian project, as I said, we have uh, uh, the near term milestones is to get the uh, water agreement with Met Center confirmed. Um, the uh, 
uh, we are in dialogue with a few uh, potential client uh, project development clients to join into the demo so that we will be will be one of the lead investors in it but we are bringing in a few partners that will co-invest in the demo uh, with Hexicon, uh, which is a, uh, uh, a way to secure future clients buying licenses on the technology. We also have a very interesting project in Spain, uh, which is uh, funded by the Spanish government, where uh, uh, it's a it's a few Spanish companies led by Axiona that is developing a floating hydrogen plant where the power comes from a wind farm with our technology and the actual hydrogen production is done either separately as on this illustration or we put actually the hydrogen uh, modules on the deck of the hexagon design. And this is a three-year engineering project that will uh, then be piloted in uh, Spanish waters. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about the Korean project already. Uh, uh, we have also working, we're working with Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners in Scotland, where, we, uh, where they uh, are developing and re-permitting a demo site into a 100 megawatt wind farm. And uh, we are happy to retain a, a significant ownership in this development. Uh, we also have uh, in uh, 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 Twin Hub, uh, the project in the UK, I mentioned, we are, have teamed up with Bechtel, one of the largest infrastructure contractors in the world, who will assist us in building up the supply chain for the UK floating wind in the Celtic Sea, and perhaps also in other jurisdictions. Uh, uh, working with Aker has a lot of benefits. It's one of the largest Norwegian companies within offshore technology, and they will enhance the project and credibility with when, when we are going with to discuss with the Swedish government about the permits in the Baltic Sea and on the West Coast. And uh, uh, looking forward, uh, we are growing the organization. Uh, we want to mature these projects. As the projects mature, the value goes up. And we will have divestments of part ownership in some of these during the next few uh, months. So I think we can see an interesting development over the next few months for Hexicon. Uh, but also opening up some new markets. And we will of course announce them as they become signed. We just announced a few weeks ago, uh, um, just before Christmas or after Christmas, the new joint venture in Italy called Aven Hexicon, uh, uh, which we'll come back to later. So with this, I'd like to end, I hope in time, and uh, uh, happy to take any questions. Okay, <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, I'm mixing a little bit my own with some questions from, from, uh, from the chat here, but if one look at competition, uh, how does that look in terms of products, uh, who else is involved into this business? How is that? Uh, how, how is that competition structured? And also the the price uh, question from from the chat. The price for installing this kind of uh, um, your, your your or your products installing your product in into the sea. How does that differ to traditional wind turbines, I, yeah. I suppose, I'm sure? No, it's a very valid question. And uh, <clears throat> uh, if I start with competition, yeah. uh, such a market of significance like this is, of course there is competition. And there are, I would say, over 50 uh, professional initiatives for uh, floater designs. But uh, over 90% of them have one turbine only on the foundation. So we're taking it one step further uh, already. And, and we're not the pioneer of, uh, because there's been already tested for 12 years, single turbine designs. But we are the early mover for doing more than that. And this is the key, uh, key driver. And, on, uh, and some of these competitors are very good. So I, you know, this is gonna be a very competitive market. Uh, number two, on price, uh, it is dependent on the sea depth, I would say. So if you are at a sea depth of 20 to 30 meters, 
we can never compete with uh, bottom fixed. The turbines are the same. 70% of the cost structure is the same for uh, floating and, and uh, bottom fixed. But when you come to water depth of 50 to 70 meters, then it becomes advantageous to go with floating wind. So we're not really competing with bottom fix because we're going into a, company, a country like Spain, which has been very uh, large in onshore wind, has no offshore wind because the floating has not been around. Mm. They have to go floating. And if you look on the cost uh, uh, development, we, we, we can actually have one design for a whole region. So the whole Atlantic coast can be done on one design only in all water depth. With bottom fix, you have to have a different design for each water depth. Here is only the mooring system that makes changes. So we can have a manufacturing facility on the same drawing, just spitting out unit after unit after unit. And that's when the cost comes down. Mm. I think it's going to be... We see already the strike price in the UK to be 120 uh, pounds per megawatt hour. We think it's going to be about uh, 80 euro per megawatt hour when, with turbines over 10 megawatts, uh, up to 15. Uh, and we know that uh, when the turb so we are sort of bringing down the cost as the turbines get grower, mm. get bigger. Mm. And, and uh, this trend, we see that it will be on par with the uh, wind farms with bottom fixed at over 50 meters. Okay. So, so <clears throat> I'm, I'm clinging on to that uh, number of, of, of 80, uh, 80, 80 years per, per, per megawatt. How does that compare to onshore wind? Onshore wind depends on how much it blows. In Sweden, you have a very good yeah. uh, low cost mm. of about 40, mm. or, I think. Mm. I think that it will be probably another 10 years before floating wind can come close to that. But uh, onshore wind will always be cheaper. We don't replace onshore wind. But if you want to scale wind as a clean energy source, you have to go offshore. Mm. So, and if you compare to nuclear, the new nuclear plants in the UK cost over 100 pounds mm. per megawatt hour. Mm. So we I we recalculate that into euros uh, euros per 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 yeah so it's a it's a hundred and twenty euro okay. or hundred and ten no. euro no, so no, it's no. it is you know we any power source that is built and depreciated is always cheaper mm. but wind is for free so mm. once you have mm. sort of depreciated the mm. asset mm. it'll be cheaper but newly built nuclear power stations coal power plants. Mm. Uh, they will not be cheaper mm. than offshore wind. Mm. And offshore wind is going to be scaled mm. and scaled on a global basis. Mm. Uh, what, uh, the durability of, of because you know, it, it's a very harsh environment to be, to be uh, out in the sea. How's the durability? Do we really know how long the turbines last on, 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 on offshore relative to onshore? Uh, yes. Have they been around that for, for that long? Or yeah, I think that uh, with uh, today's uh, modern technologies, you have a very good predictive maintenance uh, uh, yeah. schedules. And we know already, I think there was a lot of mistakes done in the beginning 20 years ago, whether you took onshore technology and put it offshore. Now they are built for offshore use from inception. And uh, the, the, the already extension, the lifetime of the, uh, the new turbines from uh, uh, 25 years up to 30 years mm. and, and upwards. So it's a good question because you haven't dismantled any old wind farms offshore yet. Uh, but uh, uh, there is so far, and from our floater point of view, they will be the longest life assets of them all. We know that the... Uh, the floating oil and gas production platforms that were built in the Swedish shipyards in the 80s, they are still in operation. Mm. 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 <clears throat> I'm thinking uh, about the, the, uh, the capital that is going into this. It's it's huge amount of capital, as, yes. as, as you said. Uh, uh, can you give us just a flavor of a medium-sized offshore floating yes. wind farm? How much is it? And, and actually, who is going there? And, and what, 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 what is their kind of, you know, idea? Why go offshore instead of onshore in Sweden? And we have a bit of a problem here that onshore is kind of getting limited because, yes. because of, you know, uh, 
uh, the the um, how should I say the the uh, the process of, of, of getting permits etc. But out beyond that, why why invest in an offshore wind farm relative to an onshore if that the, is an option? Yes, uh, if you if you have that choice, I would say that number one, the wind is much stronger mm. and more predictable mm. offshore, mm. Uh, especially in the winter time. Uh, we have already from the wind farms built in the North Sea with floating uh, technology, you have a, a capacity factor of 55 to 60 percent. Whereas onshore, close to the shore, you are at 40 to 45 percent, and onshore, you're at 30 to 35 percent. So you have much more capacity uh, taken out of the turbine mm. because mm. of wind quality. Mm. Mm. Um, but also, I think that in several jurisdictions, you get more money for your, for, for your power because the wind farm is out of sight. So com countries are willing to pay for having it uh, uh, not too close to your site. Mm. You don't want to destroy the scenery mm. Mm. of the sunset. Mm. You want to have it beyond the horizon. Mm. Mm. Um, so it's a premium electricity that comes from floating wind. But also, we know that onshore wind is very, very volatile in, term, in terms of production. Isn't that another argument exactly. for, for this I mean, as well? The cleanest wind is one kilometer uh, over the surface of the Earth. Mm. And the closer you come to the Earth, you get turbulence. Mm. Mm. And turbulence is because of hills and uh, cities and uh, forest. Mm. But at sea, you only have the waves. Mm. So that's where the wind is cleanest. Mm. Mm -hmm. Sure. <clears throat> Again, you know, what, what kind of capital is required to invest in, in, a, to, to, in a medium size? To give you a, an easy way to count, mm. I would say that for every billion dollar of capital, mm. you get 200 megawatts. Okay. A uh, little bit more as the cost goes down, mm. but that is your rule of thumb. Okay. For every billion, billion euro, or billion, uh, you will get 200 plus megawatts. Mm. And that is regarded as too small for commercial size. You probably want to have a commercial size of four to 600 megawatts mm. to make it meaningful getting the cost down. Mm. So mm. that's a four to four, you know, uh, it's a few billion mm. euro to mm. get started. Okay. And that's nothing that Hexagon will do in his own account. Mm. That's why we have this partnership model. Yeah. And it's great to learn from a company like Shell, who does these kind of billion dollar investments mm. every year mm. in oil and gas mm. and in uh, offshore wind. It seems like all the companies are very interested in, in, in this. Is, is that a fair, uh, a fair assumption that you will see a lot of the oil companies actually gradually moving over yes. to producing offshore wind. That's one of the big milestones of 2021 was that not only Shell, but now also BP and Total are investing billions of dollars into offshore wind, both bottom fixed and floating. And it's uh, the, the three oil majors balance sheets are so large that they will change the terms and conditions of this industry. And that has just started. And we were lucky to work with Shell, who was the first one already three years ago. Uh, it's a huge company, but when they move, they move with big force. And, and uh, uh, you know, the, the, the CO2 pollution of Shell is 10 times of Sweden. Mm. And they are reducing, their commitment to reduce over the next 10 years is mm. tremendous. Mm. A lot, lot of in, interesting, uh, interesting questions I have here. I think time is running out. But, but final question: You have a fairly strong financial position here now, um, um, a bit about 300 million. If I'm uh, after the, the third quarter, how do you think of that? Is that going to just finance the business, or do you, will you take equity stakes in in the projects, or what do you think about the cash use here? I, I think our our cash use uh, is gonna be very much uh, catered with, as long as uh, to, to keep it a, our our uh, growth for as long as possible. We will not take equity stakes in wind farms. Okay. Because uh, we think that we much rather open up new markets because in the long end, the, the long play is our technology uh, being installed in hundreds in several jurisdictions. Mm. Uh, we did actually in our uh, capital race when we went public say that uh, over the next, uh, within three years, we will do a, a new round. Uh, but that depends, of course, on the stock price being attractive and it depends also on the capital markets being attractive. So uh, we are cautious people. We've been working without money for seven years, 
and we're going to be very careful to, to sp how to spend this money. Thank you very much. Thanks for this very interesting presentation. And that ends uh, Hexicon's uh, presentation as of today. Thank you very much for uh, listening and uh, look forward to see you soon again.